In this episode, we're going to dive into 3D model creation for scenery objects inside of X-Plane. If you haven't already done so, please watch the previous video on setup and plugins, as you're going to need some of that knowledge to move forward. Scenery objects are simple objects, and they need to be, because we can potentially have thousands of them on the screen at a time. With simplicity come some restrictions. If you're familiar with 3D modeling already, important concepts such as groups of objects or parent-child relationships aren't going to transfer inside of X-Plane for scenery objects. In fact, you're going to be best off if you can have your model as one object and use a singular material. If you're new, these terms may be alien to you, but don't worry, it'll all make sense soon. Once again, I don't care what 3D modeling program you use to create your asset. Whether that's Blender, Maya, Max, Houdini, XSI, ZBrush, or SketchUp, or something else. All that matters is that you can export in an intermediary format that Blender will accept. If you can't get your model into Blender, we aren't going to get your model in the X-Plane OBJ format. If you're new, pick a program that you have access to and spend an hour watching basic tutorials. Since scenery objects are simple, we won't need much more knowledge than basic vertex, edge, and face manipulation with tools such as extrusion, inset, and bevel. Let's create a simple model very quickly in Maya to get something for you to work with. If you don't want to follow along or can't, the model is accessible in the description of this video through a download link. The reason I'm showing this in Maya is so that we'll eventually discuss the export process of assets from a 3D program into Blender and some of the pitfalls. Feel free to create your asset inside of Blender if that's what you're familiar with. You'll just get to skip all these export and import parts. Go ahead and load up your application. But before you start modeling, you'll want to make sure your units are set to meters. You may also want to make sure that your grid is set up properly as well. Scenery objects are between the size of vehicles to large buildings to give you a sense of scale. If you're messing around in the centimeter range, you're creating detail no one will ever notice. Another important feature of X-Plane is that we can have LOD, or Level of Detail. That's going to be covered in a subsequent video, but it allows us to create three versions of our model with ever-decreasing detail at 0 to 1,000 meters, 1,000 to 4,000 meters, and 4,000 to 10,000 meters distance. Our model is going to be a simple office building, such as the one you see here that I randomly chose off of a Google search. These models are incredibly simple to make and can be done using only a few basic tools inside of your 3D modeling program. Create a cube or box and scale it up to a size that makes sense. For instance, the height of the building floor is around four meters. So I'm going to move the top to that first floor. From our reference imagery, it looks like our building is deeper than it is wide. I'm going to first move the different sides of the building to get the footprint right. It looks like our building has four basic levels, and then a fifth one at the top. So in your program, you'll extrude, using whatever shortcut or hotkeys are accessible to you, four meters each time. We've got a center area that juts out from the top. We need to insert some cuts into our geometry to allow us to extrude only this central region. Using whatever insert, cut, line loop tools you may have, add two cuts to either side, wrapping completely around the geometry. Don't worry if you don't like where the final cuts are. You can move them by hand and use snapping tools to get them exactly where you want. Remember to try to work with the grid for now because it'll help you make sure things are exactly where you want them to be. Now looking at the reference imagery, I'm going to realize that a window is probably at least three feet or a meter across. Therefore, I'm going to need extra space to the left and to the right of each one of these windows. Right now, my units are set up so that each one of those lines is one meter. So I need twice as much space as I actually have to capture this component correctly. So let's go ahead and move this from being eight units wide to 16. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight windows, which means it's going to be a total of 16 units wide. So let's go ahead and grab the top and extrude that upwards and make sure that we're four units tall as well. Now we need to add windows. 
and we can do this by either adding geometry or just painting them in later. Since we're working with the highest quality version at the moment, we can carve in some detail now and remove this all later for other level of detail versions. We're also carving in detail because if you use Substance Painter to create the texture, it'll make selections and material placement literally just a few clicks of the mouse. One of the easiest way to make windows is to add some gaps and extrude the window into the model. We can add more cuts if we like, but it's difficult to make all of them the same when you're inserting cuts one at a time. The bevel tool can take a single edge and replace it with two edges some distance apart. We'll be using this tool to help us add the buffered space around each window that'll have brick on it. But first, we need to add vertical slices into our geometry to account for each window. On this first segment, we have two windows, therefore we're going to need at least one cut to separate this into two areas. Here we have eight windows, and another eight windows over here. Therefore, we're gonna need at least seven slices to create those eight individual slots. Now, what we'll notice is that on each floor, there's a buffer space between each window. So we can use the bevel tool to create that buffer space. If we go ahead and grab each of our floor segments that we have here, right click and bevel edge, we'll then get a spacer between each floor. And if we change this a little bit so that they're a little bit closer to each other, what you'll notice is this thin set of faces here is where our edge used to be. We can think about this area here as where our window is going to be. Adjust this to your liking. Now this trick won't work on the top and bottom elements as you'll notice here using the bevel tool. So if you're new to 3D modeling, better to just eyeball it and add another cut here than try to deal with this excess geometry that's been created. If you're new to 3D modeling and wonder what the heck I just did, all I did was copy one of these segments where I'm going to have brick and then move it to the top and bottom and use its halfway midpoint to determine where the top and bottom cut should be so that they follow exactly the same cuts that you see everywhere else in our model. This way, when I get to UV unwrapping, all of my objects are the same size and I don't have to worry about anything being weirdly shaped. Now, once again, we have to do the same process for the front of our object right here. So let's go ahead and do one, two, three, four, five. Do the same thing on the other side, grabbing all these elements and moving them to the correct place. One, two, three, four, five. Since we have five windows, we're going to need four cuts. We have our windows. However, what we don't have currently is the spacing between each window, as you can see right here. We're once again going to use the bevel tool to cut things up even further. So go ahead and grab every single window line that you have. Now some parts might pose problems for you, and that is right here where you see this element intersect this area over here. Now there are many ways we can handle this. One way is that we can go ahead and try using our bevel tool again. As you can see here, we end up with the same spacing throughout the entire object, but we do end up with a few little problem areas such as right here and here. You could also go in and make sure you manipulate your grid so that you have even spacing, and you can make the cuts individually each time, one after the other. It's entirely up to you. I'm going to go ahead and make my selections on areas that I know will not give me problems, such as these corners here where additional polygons are created at the intersection. And then I'll go in and make my cuts for those specific areas just like I did for the top area up here and the bottom area down there. Let's go ahead and bevel and then move this to something that I like. Taking a look at our reference material, we have a little bit more space between each window, so once again, tweaking the numbers until I like what I see. So now I'm gonna go in and make my edge cuts along each of these areas where I forgot to do that. Now that we've made all of our cuts and made each window an individual face that we can select, why don't we go through here and select those faces and then what we're gonna do is extrude them inwards. Once you have all of your selections made, go ahead and use the Extrude tool to push them inwards. Now let's go ahead and create the top of our roof. Using the same techniques and strategies, we can add cuts to the sides of the object if you don't have any present. However, in creating all of these windows, I also have some nice cuts near the edge of the building that I can raise up through an extrusion to give me a nice little edge on the top of our building. Once I have that done, I'll go ahead and extrude my faces upwards one suggestion would be to raise it up to this height here 
so that we could actually combine these polygons together. Now in doing that, I have created some polygons that are double-sided and aren't necessary. Your program should have something comparable to x-ray mode, in which case you can go inside and take a look. And if we look right here and zoom in, what we'll notice is that we actually have one, delete it, two faces right on top of each other, both of which are no longer necessary. So feel free to delete redundant detail like that from your model. Now in my case, I'm also going to want to merge those vertices together. So I'm going to use a merge vertex tool to do so with my distance very low. Since this is a building and buildings are typically hard angled, you can also manipulate what are called the normals of the surface, which is how lighting is calculated across it. I'm going to be making my normals hard edged. Now it looks like I made a few small mistakes in my selection, and these are easy to fix. Remember, never be afraid to delete parts of your model. It's very easy to go back and fix them. Here I can repair elements that I've deleted by filling in the hole, or I can select different areas and make sure I bridge them. And for those areas where extrusions are necessary, I can go back in, grab the edges around it, and push them back in, the distance that all the other windows happen to be at, and then fill in the window again. If you're going to continue, just be mindful of how much detail you add and whether it will even be visible. For instance, let's go to the bottom of the model. We'll never see the model from below the earth, so there is no reason to have a floor. Delete it. This reduces the number of polygons, and when we talk about unwrapping our model shortly, this is going to give us more texture space. Also, another thing to think about is, can we get rid of any redundant geometry? Stuff that we don't need. For instance, this entire loop across the top isn't really doing anything for us, and we could delete it if we want to. In addition, there's lots of redundant and excess geometry up here on this ceiling. We could, for instance, grab all of the different vertices on top of the building, which we have 116 of right now, and merge them into one single central vertex. That reduced us from 2,612 vertices down to 2,497. Now let's get to unwrapping our model, which means taking the 3D surface and projecting it into 2D. When it's in a 2D space, we can use images to add color and more detail to the surface without having to add more geometry. If your program has workspaces, switch to the UV workspace. When you added the box, there's a good chance your application automatically made UVs for it. But with all the cutting and extruding you've done, it has completely messed up your UV coordinates for each vertex or point of your model. Most programs have an automatic unwrap option, and you can try to use this, especially for simple models. However, you don't get fine-tuned control over the layout or orientation of the pieces. And if you're bringing this into image editing software to manually create the textures, you're going to have a difficult time knowing where everything is. Now, when structures become a little bit more complex, especially when they might start to become more organic, a technique I typically use is to add my own cuts inside of the UV space. I'll look at the object from some sort of off angle, not down either the X, Y, or Z axis, and I'll use a camera projection. The reason I do this, and not down a specific axis, is because several of the tools used in UV editing require some thickness to the surface, and if you project from the X, Y, or Z axis, some parts of the building will turn into a line with zero area. So for instance, projecting down this axis means the entire sides of this building, over here, become infinitely thin lines. If you choose some arbitrary view, you're very likely that no part of your surface will have zero area. How you break apart your model is going to be a factor of what program you use to paint it. If you're using a 2D image editor like Photoshop, you'll want to place things logically and keep parts connected so that as you draw, you don't have lots of small gaps and pieces to handle. However, if you use a program such as Substance Painter, which allows you to draw directly on the 3D model, the location and orientation, and even how many sub-pieces of the model you cut up matters less. Optionally, if you are using Substance Painter and the latest version as of February 2020, you can allow that program to automatically create your UVs by deleting them inside of your 3D modeling package or making sure that they're not exported when you go to create that file. One thing that does matter is making selection easier. This topic kind of transcends this video and begins to get into the actual part on texturing. So to keep it simple for now, try to keep like objects together. And if they are made out of the same thing, connected if possible. However, in doing so, if you notice lots of distortions or strange unwrappings, consider cutting it up further. 
this building is very boxy, so you should end up with UVs that are very straight, horizontally, and vertically. You'll probably need to mess this part up a few times and go back and forth between unwrapping and texturing before you truly get a handle on this bit, which we'll discuss in the next video. So long, and goodbye.